Hello and welcome to China Focus. I'm Shelley Zhang. For decades, mainland China has been dominated by state-run media, but recent years have seen big changes. These days, besides state-run media, there are thousands of more commercial newspapers, radio stations, and TV broadcasters. And with more than half a billion internet users, China also has an increasingly active online community. So, what do all these changes mean for press freedom, and what do they mean for how we in the West are able to learn what's really happening in China? Joining us today is Sarah Cook, the senior research analyst for East Asia at Freedom House. She's one of the authors of the China chapter of the 2013 Freedom of the Press reports, which was released yesterday and is available on the Freedom House website. Sarah, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So, what have we seen uh, change in the media landscape in China over the last year? I think what we've seen is this increasing changes in the balance of how Chinese people find out about breaking news. So, on the one hand, you have more and more people accessing the internet, accessing microblogs, whose content is censored, but at the same time people often being able to outpace censors, particularly when it comes to news that's breaking and they actually get there before the state-run media. The flip side of it is that the Chinese government and the Communist Party are increasing their pressure on the mainstream media. So the tightness of controls, the intrusiveness of controls, particularly on print media, uh, has been tightened uh, and uh, over the last few years, and we saw that even more dramatically in 2000. So one of the things that I found interesting in the report was you mentioned um, this idea of like state-run media trying to kind of stay kind of ahead of the game and like reporting on things first. I think a lot of us think of you know state-run media as, as being never reporting anything negative. And it used to be that that was the case in China, but as there have been more and more alternative sources of information for Chinese people, state-run media have been forced to report on information that's negative or information they might not like to tell people about. But what they do instead is they try to get ahead of the story, and then the propaganda department and the forces that control the media in China essentially require newspapers, um, online uh, portals to post the information from main, like primary Chinese state-run news agencies. So you have Xinhua News Agency being the only one to have access to certain information, and then other um, outlets for distributing information in China being required to only use that version. So how are they kind of, you know, communicating that to these other newspapers or other media? Well, you have to understand, in China there's a very sophisticated and adaptive system of controls that includes the Communist Party's central propaganda department and branches going down provincial levels all the way down to local levels that issues almost daily directives, in some case about to, to media and to online editors about what information they are allowed to post, are not allowed to post, that they should monitor and censor users in the case of social media and stop information that should stop being circulated. For traditional media, it may not be every day, but it's on a regular basis. And you see, we, you actually see more and more people and journalists being able to leak what these directives say. And they explicitly often will say, only use the Xinhua News Agency version uh, for this particular topic or event. I think that kind of happened with H7N9 recently, where they were kind of reporting on more cases, but then people started uh, reporting on Weibo that, oh, there were cases in other areas that weren't being reported in official media, and then that got shut down pretty quickly. So you see that on the one hand, there's efforts to shut down independent reporting. On the other hand, you see in some cases where they're unable to do that, state-run media adjusting, and there were reports, for instance, that one of the cases ended up then appearing in a Xinhua news agency report, and this, this type of balance where the government makes concessions in some cases, but then information that it really wants to remain uh, hidden. Uh, it still it still keeps that information. So, so what you were saying about that H seven and nine that case appearing in Xinhua after not being there before does that mean that there's a certain amount of pressure that the people are putting on what uh, kind of affecting what gets reported on in official media? Absolutely, I would say both ordinary citizens who are posting information on microblogs. Uh, in this case, some case in some case it might be doctors, in some case it may be citizen journalists and journalists themselves. You really see a lot of effort among professional journalists in China to push the limits of permissible reporting. And sometimes they get censored, sometimes they get dismissed, but they'll really try to use whatever avenues they can to get information that they feel is important now. In some cases, if they can't do it through their media, they'll do it on their own microblog accounts. But we, sometimes they'll be punished even for that. 
So for some of these more commercial media, are they able to push boundaries because of their commercial nature, or is there something else going on? Well, part of the idea is that now they have responsibility to users. They want to get their circulation numbers up, um, and so they want to have daring information and, and new information that are going to make people buy the newspaper. Um, you also have just professional journalists, and in some cases, situations where rather than paying the journalist after, the inform after their article is printed, they pay them whether it gets censored or not. So you have a bit more incentives in some of these outlets to really push the boundaries. At the same time, the response from the authorities is to be increasingly intrusive. So you actually had, even this past year, as you were mentioning, it was a very uh, dynamic year for Chinese politics. And you had things that were unusual even in the tightly controlled Chinese media environment. So for instance, with regards to the Bo Xilai, um, there was actually a People's Daily, a state run, the main Chinese Communist Party's mouthpiece, ran an editorial. And all the newspapers in China were all required, whether they were commercial or party, to put it on the front page. So, so there's, be, still, there's still so, control. So there's that. definitely still control. Um, it's just that journalists try to push as far as they can within the space that they have to get information that they feel would be of both interest and importance to their readers, but to some extent also helps in terms of commercialization because it raises the circulation numbers and then they get more advertising and that's what they need to survive financially. Now I want to ask about the, a particular article that came out a couple weeks ago in Lens Magazine. Uh, and it was about the Masanya labor camp, kind of an expose on some women who had been in that camp and then been tortured. And it was uh, really shocking to see something like this published uh, in, in, by even a commercial newspaper uh, magazine, actually, in China. I think it was a real breakthrough. Um, and it really shows uh, uh, the daringness of the journalists. It shows uh, that there's clearly some kind of internal political protection that that journalist has to be able to get that out. Now, you have to keep in mind, this journalist said he'd been working on this article for five years. But this was this, you know, political moment where he read the tea leaves and thought it could get come out. But and that also, was because of the, they're talking about labor camp reform right now. Talking about labor camp reform, talking about um, a, a, the person who's now in charge of the committee, the Communist Party committee that runs the labor camps is politically weaker than his predecessor was very strong. So you have these kinds of internal party dynamics that can play into these issues. Um, but I think the other thing that you saw is almost immediately the censors came down, especially in terms of circulating it online. So it was deleted, most of the online references were deleted. Um, and this was a fairly small magazine, so it was spread mostly online not necessarily through the direct circulation. But even in that interim, you really saw social media users and people who, who came across the magazine article um, really expressing shock. I mean, really, you know, they know that the Chinese government is abusive. They know that they, 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 they persecute people. But to actually see in detail the level of torture that was happening at this camp shocked a lot of people uh, who even are already kind of cynical about the Chinese government's human rights record. But the kind of the, the cover up afterwards, what happened to that journalist? Has, is he still all right? As far as I know, as far as I've heard, there haven't been reports of him being harassed or persecuted um, or dismissed. Um, but sometimes that kind of fallout can happen a little bit later. Um, what we did hear about was um, some of the people who were quoted in the article, the petitioners who had already gone through these horrific experiences in the labor camp being harassed by police, uh, particularly, ironically, at the same time as the local government was claiming to do its own investigation, um, the people who w were actually quoted uh, were, were facing harassment. So how does that affect, for example, how um, Western media report on these kinds of issues? Um, the general media landscape, like the example of the Lens Magazine article, what were we hearing in the West about that? So on the one hand, these kinds of articles give fodder for an, an important first-hand source for Western media to cite in terms of their own reporting on what's happened in Masanjia and of course the Chinese public's reaction to it. But I think what's disappointing in some cases with Western media coverage is that there are actually people who have been in Masanja who are now have escaped and have fled outside who could be who have been available for interview. Um, there, there are ways in which there's, there's no real reason why Western media couldn't have broken this story themselves. That you had to wait for a Chinese journalist who had to make much greater take a much greater risk than perhaps a Western journalist or media outlet would have had to in order to get information about what was happening in a camp like this. So what are some of the challenges that Western media are facing in China's media environment? I mean, to be fair, it's 
it's not easy reporting environment for foreign correspondents. Um, people have to be very careful increasingly about whether they'll be able to keep their visas because in, and their access to China. Increasingly, the Chinese government is putting pressure on foreign journalists. And this last year, we had two cases of journalists who's because of visa issues, were forced to leave China. And that's the first time that's happened in 14 years. But there's actually physical dangers. More and more, we're seeing more and more assaults and attacks, in some cases involving baseball bats. And you know, real injuries to the journalists uh, and their, their crew are encountering foreign journalists when they're trying to report, especially on protests, um, localized protests in China. Do you think there's also a commercial concern for Western media? For example, Bloomberg and New York Times both got uh, blocked in China this past year? I mean, you know, when they're reporting or when they're blocked, then there is a real financial hit for these companies. And the Chinese government knows that. And that's one of the, the types of pressures that they use. But, you know, to the credit of a lot of media and a lot of journalists who are on the ground, they, they're just like their Chinese colleagues, you know, they push what they can uh, where they're able to and where they feel it's safe for them. But also they're very concerned about the safety of the sources and the people they're talking about. So it's, it's not it's easy, like a, but, but balance it's then. really an obstacle course to, to get information out on things that the Chinese government wants to keep kept hidden. So just really quickly, what do you see coming up in the next year or two years? Are we going to be seeing the same kind of dance between like, the party censors and, you know, these like more independent journalists? Absolutely. I mean, we had a leadership change in November, but the fellow who took over for his predecessor in running the censorship and propaganda apparatus is known as a hardliner. We haven't seen any let up from that perspective. On the contrary, more regulations to try to obstruct, for instance, journalists using my microblogs to, to disseminate un, uncensored information. Um, but you also see Chinese people not giving up. So I think we're exactly going to see this dance. And, and that's really the question, this daily challenge to just get information out. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us today. And thanks for watching. For the Freedom House Report, you can visit the website below. And for more on this and other issues in China, join us at ntd.tv.